Thank you, Wes. Yes, uh, as Wes said, I'm I'm Aaron uh, with both Sencor and Plexus. So I have kind of a, um, I guess a unique perspective on some of these things because I work for Sencor, um, which is uh, primarily in the broadcast space. So obviously, NAB 2024. That's why we're here. But uh, two years ago, we also started a kind of a sub brand aimed specifically at the pro AV market, which is where IPMX has kind of come up uh, and has been focused at the pro AV market, not just the broadcast side. So the fact that I've been in the broadcast side for 14 plus years, but also starting to get more and more involved in the pro AV space as well, um, I can kind of see how these two industries um, could potentially converge on a single uh, technology kind of foundation and, and be able to exchange content between broadcast and pro AV workflows, um, even products crossing over from pro AV into broadcast and vice versa. So um, I truly believe there's going to be kind of a convergence over the next couple of years as IPMX really starts to gain adoption. Um, 2110 is obviously very heavily adopted in the broadcast side from a production perspective, um, but IPMX tends to, uh, or is kind of relaxed Relaxing some of the uh, the heaviness, the uh, the engineering need that 2110 systems require, and make it a little bit more plug and play for users. So I think there's benefits on both sides, the broadcast uh, and pro AV space to to benefit from these things. So that's what I'm going to talk about today is is that crossover. So uh, yeah, the. The pro AV and broadcast markets are uh, experiencing a major crossover in technologies, uh, workflows, and even manufacturers. Um, like I said, with uh, coming from uh, Sencor, uh, we are now dipping our toe into the uh, pro AV space with our with our Plexus AV brand. Um, but the creation of content is really driving this convergence. So the actual production space. Um, so content is king, and it is the primary driver for change um, in both of these industries. Um, and for many years, AV systems have been transitioning to completely IP-based systems, um, which is where 2110 kind of kicked all of that off in the, uh, in the broadcast space. Um, but really, all of this is enabling new workflows like remote production uh, and production in the cloud. Um, so to give you a little bit of background, so what the broadcast industry looked like before IP, um, really before the advent of IP, uh, broadcasters used SDI to transport baseband content across vast networks of cabling, SDI switchers, um, and all synchronized with GenLock and frame syncs. Um, but the issue with SDI and, and physical cabling um, is really the inability to evolve systems to address uh, you know, higher resolutions, higher frame rates. If you had an SD-SDI-based system that only supported SD resolutions and you needed to transition to HD, you had to completely gut the entire system and rebuild it. The cabling wouldn't be able to support the bandwidth. Uh, the SDI switches would have to get upgraded. Lots and lots of time and money spent to rebuild. And the same thing happened with HD, SDI, <laughs> HD, SD, SDI, and uh, 1080p60. Even HD systems didn't support uh, 1080p60, and so they had to be rebuilt for 3G SDI. So this is just kind of this continuous problem of kind of a build and burn situation. You're building for a certain technology, something else comes along, it won't work. You gotta completely tear it down and, and start from scratch. Um, and then looking into the future with uh, you know 4K, 8K, and uh, frame rates higher than 60 frames per second, it's kind of the same exact situation. Um, you would have to really just build and burn. Uh, and then going to the other side is the, the pro AV space. Um, and so the pro AV, um, pro AV before IP, um, while still use, using SDI, also uses HDMI very heavily, um, which comes with its own set of challenges when repeating signals or splitting signals amongst displays, dealing with HDCP, EDID, ARC, uh, and other pro, uh, protection and uh, communication protocols. Um, it's really kind of the similar experience with SDI when talking about expansion or uh, adopting higher resolutions and frame rates. The physical cabling, the repeaters, the switches, all of that equipment that is used to actually transport that those signals all over need to be completely replaced. Um, you know, it, HDMI cables don't necessarily support 4K over really long runs. That 4K signal or a 4K cable won't support 8K. Um, so it's really the same problem and just a different type of connector is really what it is. So really it's uh, looking for a better path forward. Um, and so both industries uh, needed a clear path forward. Obviously the broadcast side uh, was looking ahead um, in terms of being able to adopt technologies uh, much more cleanly, much more effectively, 
Um, and so going to an all IP, IP based AV system uh, was really the answer. And so each industry uh, leached, uh, <laughs> leapt into AV over IP in their own way. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, the pro AV industry experienced a huge boom in AV over IP systems over the last, um, I would say, five years. Um, and really most of these systems are based on pr proprietary technologies, um, but they do offer a very plug and play user experience. So that same experience of plugging an HDMI cable into a back of a piece of equipment and it all just working, it was very, very easy. But with IP, you get into unicast and multicast and the need to um, you know, synchronize networks across uh, multiple campuses and things like that. The AV over IP systems in the pro AV industry did a very good job of actually making kind of that adoption of IP uh, very clean, very easy to do. Um, but what the problem with proprietary systems is you pick a proprietary technology and you get kind of locked in as an end user to uh, specific uh, vendor solutions. Um, but again, it was really kind of the focus on usability um, and cost uh, that enabled content creators, uh, enterprise end users, and really everywhere in between to take advantage of AV over IP in the pro AV industry. Then you shift gears into the, into the broadcast space. Um, and it, this entire industry is really driven by standardized technologies, interoperability, those kinds of things. And so standards organizations and work groups um, really made up of experts, manufacturers, and end users uh, came together to define the technologies that could be used to uh, better the industry, essentially. And due to the high profile nature of broadcast production, um, equipment can be expensive. Uh, the systems can actually be quite complicated and require kind of an engineering level of knowledge to deploy operate and maintain. Um, it's kind of just how the broadcast industry is. It's a lot of engineers getting together to define technologies so it can be kind of heavy and not necessarily user friendly, but very, very powerful um, and, and works very, very well. So this is kind of uh, talking about the evolution of uh, 2110 uh, in the broadcast industry. Uh, just to give you some background here. So SMPTE 2110, uh, SD 2110, uh, it's a set of standards that define the carriage of video, audio, and metadata in a broadcast production IP network. Uh, these standards include definitions for the carriage of uncompressed video and audio, timing between streams, buffer models for transmitting and receiving functions um, inside these networks. So in addition to the carriage of all of that, uh, that data, like the video, the audio, the metadata, there is also a control plane called NMOS, um, and this was developed by AMWA, uh, in another series of standards that define management, control, orchestration um, of an entire 2110 system. So device registration and discovery, stream routing, audio mapping, all of this stuff is, is covered in NMOS and used to kind of replicate what would be uh, kind of in an old school SDI production system. Um, so as 2110 has kind of grown with broadcast, um, it's not saying that it was done without any challenges. Um, definitely 2110 and NMOS have, have had their challenges and in the early days of adoption, um, issues with PTP, um, you know, the actual timing mechanism within a, uh, within a 2110 system that acts as genlock, frame sync, and time code, kind of all at the same time. Um, issues with NMOS interop, audio mapping, malformed IP packets and SDP files, lots and lots of different challenges that manufacturers um, and broadcasters have had to face kind of going along the road of transitioning uh, production networks to full IP um, definitely had its uh, bumps in the road. So this is where IPMX kind of starts to step in, right? We've got this entire you know, technology stack um, that the, the broadcast industry is already using. Well, IPMX kind of comes in and helps kind of alleviate the, uh, the need for an engineering level of understanding in order to adopt such a system. So IPMX is an open set of standards based on the success of 2110, but is poised to provide an interoperable foundation for technologies for both industries, for both the pro AV industry specifically, but also for the broadcast industry. So it has all the flexibility of 2110 and NMOS, but with tweaks to provide a more plug and play user experience the pro AV industry needs as well. And here is a long list <laughs> of the actual standards that are part of IPMX, but you've got the system and timing definitions, um, 
standards that call for uncompressed video, compressed video, uh, constant bitrate compressed video, uh, audio requirements, HDCP key exchange, forward error correction, you name it. This is a kind of a, a soup to nuts type of, uh, uh, I guess, technology stack that does not only the carriage, but also the management and control of an entire uh, production IP workflow. And all of these organizations here um, and groups have been hard at work developing IPMX, knowing the power and the flexibility of 2110 in the broadcast industry. Um, but it's really made up of broadcasters and pro AV professionals um, kind of combining their insight on how IPMX can serve both industries and provide a single interoperable technology stack um, that content curators uh, can adopt on both sides uh, of the industry. So like I was saying, IPMX builds upon 2110, uh, makes some tweaks to the standards and adds additional functionality to maximize interoperability, uh, scalability, and more importantly, uh, ease of use. Um, these key changes are to the timing requirements, um, at least in my opinion, like some of the key changes were for the timing requirements. Um, by relaxing the timing and buffer models, IPMX is a more software and cloud-friendly uh, technology stack, which is really, really important for uh, doing production and cloud workflows and uh, having software products that are able to do, um, you know, things like color mastering and uh, graphic overlays and all of that kind of stuff. Um, this really opens up the possibilities for more software workflows, um, including the editing software that I was talking about um, and having native support for um, IPMX uh, without the need of special hardware. Um, IPMX also accounts for asynchronous and synchronous sources. So that provides some flexibility uh, commonly needed in hospitality networks where uh, not all signals, uh, signal sources are locked to a single clock. Um, also the requirement for PTP synchronization has been, uh, I guess, relaxed or removed entirely in some cases. Um, IPMX devices use RTCP packets to retime senders and uh, receivers which drastically simplifies network architecture um, and reduce the cost of deployments. Um, and if PTP is actually present in a network, it can still be used to improve uh, stream switching latency, accuracy, and overall network uh, latency as well. So it can do both, which is nice. So uh, the benefits of IPMX in the broadcast industry uh, broadcasters would gain the additional uh, flexibility uh, thanks to changes to, IP, to IPMX to scale from one gigabit to 100 gigabit networks. Um, IPMX has been developed to utilize compressed, uh, lightly compressed, uh, which is JPEG XS, uh, high throughput J2K and some other codecs, as well as uh, high compression video codecs like HEBC and H.264. Uh, it really just provides a lot of options to scale systems depending on what the requirements are um, and can drastically uh, reduce uh, network, network requirements for bandwidth and things like that. Um, but live events that require quick deployment um, and are usually in temporary, fa temporary facilities, um, IPMX simplifies the deployment by not requiring uh, complicated timing equipment uh, for PTP and things like that. And then of course, NMOS, the control plane piece of it being fully integrated into IPMX, really gets it into that plug and play deployment so that when devices are plugged into the network, they're automatically discovering each other. They're, they're saying what they can and can't do, what they're capable of, what streams are they actually transmitting. And you get the uh, senders and receivers able to communicate and make a much more, um, really a user-friendly uh, uh, production network. Um, 2110 and IPMX systems can also exchange streams with relative ease and little impact to latency. So this is a very key thing, I think. Um, the video and audio and metadata um, really all remains untouched when going from a 2110 system into an IPMX system. So it preserves the video and audio quality and doesn't require any heavy processing to actually convert those streams between the two, uh, two networks, which is very, very good. Um, and again, if PTP is present, video and audio codecs match between the systems uh, and the streams can be exchanged freely. And if PTP is not present, uh, retiming in the addition of RTCP packets would be needed. And again, this does not affect the video, audio, or metadata being carried. Um, it's really just a simple um, change in timing um, with a gateway type function. So really what this gets into is, you know, you have a, your broadcast 2110 production network you know, something like the, the Super Bowl or a very high profile event could be done in a 2110 system that is um, you, the highest of requirements, uh, the highest quality, the lowest latency, all of that. 
but then you could also exchange that content from a 2110 system into an IPMX network. So a really good example of this would be actually in a stadium where you're doing all of your production in trucks and with all the cameras and stuff like that, doing the main feed for the Super Bowl. You could then have a side carrier network that is actually doing all of the signage inside the stadium for instant replays or digital signage and all of that. That could be an IPMX network taking it right off of that 2110 network with very little um, hardware processing and stuff like that. So there's instant replays. You obviously you're at the you're actually in the stadium and you want to see the, the instant replay. It needs to be very, very low latency compared to what's happening, um, you know, inside inside the stadium. And you could exchange those uh, streams very easily between those two networks instead of having to do transcoding or uh, all kinds of heavy lifting things that would uh, introduce latency, potentially reduce video quality, that kind of stuff. Uh, there's also a cost benefit here. Um, the pro AV industry um, on that side kind of depends on more cost effective but still very capable solution. Um, so this really just drives down the cost of deployment and ownership of Pro-AV systems. Um, and IPMX is poised to offer a lower cost alternative to a full-fledged 2110 system, which I think a lot of broadcasters would appreciate, kind of depending on what the application, you know, the, the amount of, uh, I guess, if it's a really um, high profile event like the Super Bowl, obviously there's gonna be a lot more money behind it, but not every event is the Super Bowl, right? You're gonna have uh, budget constraints and things like that. And IPMX tends to lend itself to be more cost effective, quick to deploy, um, but still enable a lot of the, uh, the uh, features and functionality that a 2110 system um, would have. So really broadcasters have the ability to deploy a, uh, a 2110 system style thing, um, but at uh, a much, much lower cost. And then again, the ease of use, um, you know, NMOS is fully integrated into the IPMX standard. So this is really what focuses on the plug and play aspect of a production system. Uh, control, management, and orchestration is, is built into the standard from the start. Um, and I keep saying it, but the lack of requirement of PTP greatly simplifies the network requirements of an IPMX system. Uh, the devices and software functions in an IPMX system retime themselves thanks to the RTCP packets um, and really provide valuable information on media clocks for transmitters and receivers to synchronize to each other. Uh, and then performance. Um, still very, very low latency, just like 2110. Um, it's really the entire technology is focused on uh, uh, being very low latency for, uh, for, for production systems. Um, for uncompressed system, you're looking at sub millisecond latency uh, for light compression systems using JPEG XS or uh, high throughput J2K, you're at subframe latency. Um, and if you need more streams in a small gigabit network, you know, you're looking at 80 to 150 milliseconds end to end um, when possible when using HEVC. Um, so really, it, it's still very, very low latency, no matter uh, what video codec you're using. And then seamless and hitless switching. Um, so when you're switching between different uh, signal sources, um, is supported at IPMX. Um, when a PTP clock is present, um, obviously you need the PTP clock there. If it is there, um, it ensures precise timing between signals and devices. But if it is not there, it still does very, very fast switching. So that's, uh, that's a nice thing to have. So just talking about use cases of uh, IPMX in the broadcast space, I kind of stole my own thunder with this, but I do actually have a network diagram. Um, this is really kind of the stadium and large venue um, kind of layout here. So you have your uh, you know cameras with uh, either SDI or HDMI in this case, um, feeding into the IPMX network. Um, and then you have your management control being done with NMOS. And then you're um, able to do your um, 2110 system kind of in line with this with this system. So you could have your full fledged, you know, Super Bowl high tier event all being done in 2110, uh, going to the OB truck and then being broadcast over satellite or a uh, high bitrate fiber or something like that. But then the uh, IPMX stream can then be used to, uh, you know, fuel replays and billboards, digital signage. Um, all of that kind of stuff. And all of these streams can be, um, you know, exchanged between these two uh, IP-based networks. So really, really powerful stuff. Yep, and that actually plays nice with um, with a lot of the IPMX stuff, as well as NDI. NDI is not up here either. So that's another uh, really common pro AV um, production technology. So a lot of those kind of integrate with IPMX systems with, with gateway functions and kind of doing, uh, you know, kind of a transcoding or repackaging and things like that. So, yep, all of that stuff's there. 
So kind of look into the future of what things look like. Um, obviously, AV over IP will continue to grow. Um, I really think IPMX is poised to kind of be that 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 technology stack that both broadcasters and the pro AV space will will adopt for um, all of the benefits of 2110. But again, with that ease of use, that uh, I guess reduced cost of deployment. Um, all of those kinds of things. So I really think it'll be, like I said, that foundation uh, um, for AV over IP in, in both industries. And really it's it comes down to collaboration being the key piece of this. Um, you know, the broadcast and pro AV space are, are vastly different, but also weirdly similar. But I think if all of us are, you know, communicating what the requirements are and making sure things are getting captured, I think it's gonna be a very easy thing for this to get adoption and, and continue to grow, so. And I think the organizations that are involved are, are definitely doing that job and making their voices heard and, and the people that are involved are, are capturing all those requirements. So I think it'll, it'll be a good, good technology moving forward. So. Questions, you can reach out to me at either one of the companies. <laughs> if it's a broadcast question, I guess go to Sencor. If it's a pro AV question, you go to Plexus. But um, yeah, either way, uh, if you wanna have questions uh, after the fact or if you have any questions for me now, I'll be